What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview, the number one podcast in the industry for real estate agents to learn how to get shit done. Make sure to check us out at www.gsdmode.com to check out other GSD Mode podcast interviews and other additional free content, free webinar trainings, and more epic content that I'm always putting out there to help real estate agents like you crush your real estate goals. Just a few quick plugs before we begin. If you are a driven real estate agent that has big goals, big dreams, and want to create greatness, then check out my personal mentorship coaching program at www.90daymastery.com where you can see how it works, what you can expect, see a ton of testimonials about the massive success other realtors just like yourself have experienced with the program, and learn why thousands and thousands of real estate agents have decided to join my personal coaching program to help them change their business and life forever. All right, so is real estate agents Hands down, by far, the number one most important tool in our real estate business is our CRM. If you want to use the exact same website and CRM I use that provides you with all my personal follow-up drips that allows my team to generate thousands of leads each and every month and close two-plus homes every single day, check us out at www.perfectstormnow.com to see the best, most effective, and affordable website CRM system on the planet. If you are going to sign up, make sure to go to perfectstormgsd.com. You want to make sure that you go there and register, perfectstormgsd.com, where you can get the registration free waived and only pay $199 a month. All right, one last quick thing. Your support truly means a lot. If you find these interviews and any other GSD Mode content powerful, please make sure to share it with anyone that you feel can benefit from this content. All right, it is time to jump on into today's GSD Mode podcast interview. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smithy with another GSD Mode podcast interview, where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate agents, and those that are just out there straight up dominating their space. So people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And that's why they agree to come on the show and, and give us their valuable time and all their insight and amazing knowledge that we can all learn from. So you guys, today we've got a really special guest on the show. Um, I'm really excited for this. You know, this there, there's there's so many changes with technology and it, it just life, but also in you know, the real estate industry. Um, um, and um, this is a, our first guest that we've ever actually had as a specialist in, in this space to really talk to us about what this looks like. This is going to be something that we need to be prepared for. That's going to be a big transition and shift for, for the rest of our, our, our careers and lives. Um, so our guest today, you guys, uh, um, is currently the CEO and founder of Quantum RE, which is a cryptocurrency startup that supports homeowners by helping them sell a fraction of their equity without going out there and taking on debt, without having to go through a refi, um, as well as a, a long career of, of a lot of other successful entrepreneurship ventures. So, guys, I'm really stoked and honored to have our guest, Matt Silva, on the show. Welcome to show, my friend. Joshua, thank you for having me on. I'm delighted. <laughs> Can't wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, man. Like, like I told you before we hit the record button of, you know, this is something that, I mean, it's coming. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say it's, it's here, you know, right? It's just going to gain popularity. Um, um, you know, I didn't know where it was going to go just because, you know, with the government lacking an element of control, but now you're seeing so much government buy-in and, and, and obviously the, the general public wants it, you know, right? Um, um, and it, it's going to change so many spaces of how we operate. And, and you know, I, I love to, as much as we can, to prepare as much as we can, you know, educate the consumer, be educated ourselves. And um, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to go deep on this with you. But before we get into it, um, yeah, I'm always intrigued in our guest journeys that led them <laughs> based anyway. Like, you know, when you were probably, you know, starting an entrepreneurship journey, probably, I mean, cryptocurrency, like, you, you know, like we always take these paths and sometimes we, you know, like we didn't necessarily plan on being in this space or, or wherever it may be. Um, but man, if we were on the clocks, like what led you to this, this in the first place? It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> is my, is my favorite answer. It's something that, I mean, my, I, as you say, I'm an entrepreneur, which to, to many people, the reality of being an entrepreneur means you, you are just 
you know, congenitally unemployable. So for the, you know, for the last 25, 30 years, I've run my own business and um, I've found myself involved in technology, um, finance, um, or telecommunications. So something to do with those um, has always been really interesting to me. When I came over here almost five years ago, I um, sort of went to this sort of regular uh, group where we would meet up every weekend and sort of discuss uh, new trends and sort of, you know, like a, a bit like a networking group, but without all of the, you know, all of the networking. And we were uh, talking about blockchain and Bitcoin and all this sort of stuff years ago. And I, frankly, I, you know, I heard the words, I just couldn't understand what blockchain and Bitcoin was. And I think it was only really when Bitcoin started, you know, going through the roof that I and probably millions of other people started paying attention to it. Um, but to answer your question in a very long winded way, I got into it because I got faint signals from the future. So having been involved in internet technologies right at the very beginning, uh, this seemed very similar. It sort of started to feel very familiar. So um, I started doing a deep dive into how I could get involved in blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and all that sort of stuff about two years ago. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, so then, you know, I mean, for, for most of us that are probably on this podcast, including myself, you know, like, I mean, I, you hear the terms, you hear the, you know, um, you know, most of us, like, I know you had software technology background, finance background, and, you know, most real estate agents, you know, they don't, they have a different, whatever it may be where, you know, they can't wrap their head around like, you know, most agents, I think I said this before we hit the, 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 the record button. And when I say most agents, like I'm including myself in this, you know, right? Like I have a very little idea other than like, I know it exists. Yeah. Right. I've watched a couple of documentaries on it, but even then I still kind of don't get it. Yeah. You know, right. Uh, of, of, you know, um, if you were to break it down, um, like to the most simplistic level of, of what cryptocurrency is blockchain and, 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 just to give us some education on it. Um, of course. You know. I mean, the important thing is to separate cryptocurrencies from the blockchain. So the first thing is they're not the same thing. In the same way that email and the internet is not the same thing. So email is something that sits and works because of the internet. So if you think about cryptocurrencies that way, um, cryptocurrencies is something you can do with the blockchain. Now, the, the blockchain is a mutually distributed ledger. And so what that means is that it's mutual in the sense that either everybody has it or nobody has it. It's distributed, which means that it doesn't just sit in one place. It sits in hundreds or thousands of different places at the same time. And it's a ledger. Now, ledgers are the fundamental cornerstone of business going back thousands and thousands of years and a ledger will keep a record of who owns this who bought this who sold it who transferred it what is it where did it come from and ledgers take all sorts of different forms whether it's a ledger that is your bank account or a, a ledger that maintains in as far as a house or home ownership is concerned the title so if you think about title deeds they're a form of ledger because they, they manage or they tell you who owned the home before you and who owned the home before that person. Now, the problem with ledgers historically is that they tend to be held by one person, and that person could be a company or an organization. And you don't always trust that company because they can be manipulated. So if you think of um, a bank account, for example, it's possible for a um, the staff within the bank to manipulate the numbers in a bank account. It's possible for um, employees of a title company to make some changes to a title. And we've, I'm sure we've got all sorts of instances. So those ledgers are not reliable ledgers. But the way the blockchain works is it's a series of blocks where, imagine a daisy chain, and each block is a container and you pour information or data into that container and that data could be bank account records or title deeds and then you seal that block because each block can only contain a certain amount of data 
And then you, you link that block to the block behind it and you link it to the one in front of it. And you link it with a, a cryptographic code, which means that if anybody goes into any of those blocks and tries to change any of the data in there, it changes that code, breaks the chain, and makes the whole, uh, the whole uh, blockchain um, error. So in other words, it, it flags up as no longer um, a truthful statement of what happened. That doesn't happen with traditional databases. So and we then have this concept of a ledger, which is very difficult, if not impossible, to, to edit, to change. And so you hear the word immutable. So imagine once something is written, imagine it's like, you know, ch chiseling it into a large tablet of stone. It's there forever. And then what you do is you distribute that ledger across thousands and thousands of different computers. And each one of those computers has the same copy of the same ledger. So if you want to change it, you've got to go to every single one of those computers and every single one of the people controlling that, convince them that you want to change this piece of information, get them to sign off on it. So what we have really is something that we can trust. And that's very different to the way that ledgers and databases operate right now. We don't really trust them. We always think that, well, you're probably you know, missing a piece of information. So if you think about he healthcare records, God, you know, you, know, you forgot that, that uh, visit, or if I'm trying to transfer from one healthcare operator to another, how do I know that half my records are not going to be left behind? But if your records are kept on a blockchain, then it means that nothing gets left behind because nothing gets forgotten. Um, and so what the reason the blockchain is so important is that it builds a fundamental foundation that allows us to really grow um, the way that we use the internet, because it means that we can trust transactions and records and history far more using blockchain than we can at the moment. And that means as we enter a world where everything is connected to everything else, then we can actually trust those transactions. And from a real estate perspective, you can think um, in the not too distant future, all of those records that were held in bits of paper in various different offices, over time, if they move into this, this database that is trusted and um, not controlled by one person, and um, then the ability to move ownership from one person to another becomes a lot cheaper, a lot faster, uh, and a lot more reliable. So then uh, let's just say that the, the, the doctor record example that you gave, you know, right. Um, well, I guess, I guess before I get into that, well, I'll, I'll go there first. Um, so it's okay. We can make sure that they're getting the records, but how would they go in there and access it? You know, right. Like, I mean, it's, it's a bit of software. So that's the thing. We don't need to worry about that because in the same way that when you send someone an email, you don't go, God, how does this work? You know, how does, how does this, email software interface with the hypertext transfer protocol. You don't think that, you just press send. So in other words, all of these technologies, what's happened is that everyone's talking about the technology and no one's talking about the usage case. And that's because it's new. So you need to turn that, or, or you know, we need to change that. And that, that, that is a function of time. When we were, when the internet came about, you know, 20 something years ago, Everyone was talking about surfing the web, and now no one surfs the web. You know, there was no Google then. There was maybe one or two different um, web browsers, but there were no applications. It was all, it was dull, nothing happened. Then over time, all of the various industries that we now know, you know, the banks, the travel industries, all of the financial institutions, everything moves on to the web, and those are the applications. So at the moment, everyone's fixating about the blockchain which is crazy because it's the most boring thing on earth. You don't want to know about the blockchain. You want to know about what are the applications that use the blockchain to deliver low cost, higher efficiency, greater um, opportunities for people because of the benefits that the technology brings. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can see that of, you know, like with what your company does, it's like, all right, so like, I just bought a new car recently, right? And it was like, all right, I go in there, find what I want, I mean, I'm literally in and out in 30 minutes. Like the, I go in there and finance them. I sign it. You know, like you look at like real estate. Yeah. Right. Go sign this and you got to wait three days and this gets sent and they got to push this. I mean, it's just, 
it's such yeah. a terrible experience and, and it's, it is so much wasted time. Yes. Um, um, what's that? And, what, and then you're actually, because what, but what happens is then, so the blockchain is the ledger, it's the record. It's this very large digital book that you, that you can't erase. So that's, that's all you need to think about in terms of the blockchain. But then what you were talking about is this thing, which we know as a smart contract. And a smart contract is really a piece of code that talks to the blockchain and says, okay, here's some information, push that information into the blockchain, lock it up. And then another instruction that's held in the smart contract could say, okay, we need to find that piece of data. Where is it? Oh, it's there. Let's pull that piece of data out and compare it to this piece of data. So what smart contracts do is they, they act as the interrogator or they act as the, um, the, the way to connect um, useful applications with that base layer, which is the ledger. Because if you're dealing with a company, the last thing you see is the ledger. You see the products, the services, you know, all their use cases. They don't take you to the back room and say, look, here's our ledger. You know, so it, it's, that's there. It's a fundamental part of their business. But you have to trust their record keeping to be able to do business with them. If you didn't trust your bank, you know, if you contacted your bank and you said, look, you know, I think all my money's gone somewhere. And they go, well, uh, do you know what? We just can't find it either. You know, no one would do business with those banks or with those institutions if they didn't trust their, their sort of back office system. So imagine that, but just on a much, much wider scale. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, do, I do have one more question about the blockchain and then, you know, I, I know that that's not necessarily <laughs> it's time to move on to something I, I just interesting. Had a curiosity, I got to ask it of, uh, you know, of, uh, like does each, like, all right, like Joshua Smith, right. Is it like, do I have one lifelong ledger of everything I do or are they just scattered all over inside there? And I guess it doesn't really, I don't even know if it matters, but well, how curious. many diaries is, have you kept over how many, how many ledgers do you have right now? Well, you have, you know, you have your bank account, you have your diary, you have your telephone book, you have a um, list of people to send your Christmas cards to, um, you have um, your health records, you have your dental records, you have your, how many times your car has been serviced. Um, you, we each have thousands and thousands of individual ledgers representing things that we do in our everyday lives. Yeah. So, um, um, and what happens is those are all kept in all sorts of different places. None of them talk to each other. Sometimes they lose information. Sometimes the information is incorrect. Um, so what the blockchain does, it just fixes that problem. So to answer your question, you won't see anything behind the scenes, but you'll have applications that are suddenly much more reliable. So your health records will talk to your dental records. Your dental records will talk to your, your bank account. Your car will tell you um, next time it's due an oil change you know, things like that. And, and we'll trust that data because we know that it's, it's not going to be broken and it can't be manipulated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you're right with, uh, you know, when you were first saying like, you know, your, your diary, I'm like, yeah, well, like, yeah, I got multiple, but they're all in my house or my office. But then when you say like, all right, like I don't hold my dental records or, but I know where to go. And what yes. you're saying is me knowing where to go is the software you're saying where the focus needs to be. It is I, it, like it, these just exist out there when you need it, like you know where to go and that's the software and that becomes the focus. But the important thing is to be able to trust them because if you move dental office or if you move healthcare office, you need to be able to trust that your records move from dentist to dentist or from doctor to doctor. And in many cases, you know, that doesn't happen quite as well as we'd hope them to happen. Uh, I've worked in the hospital for two years and it, it's, it's a scary thing. And, 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 but imagine, imagine if that process was reliable. So you knew categorically that you could move from dentist to dentist to dentist. And the moment you move dentist, that current dentist would have access to your absolutely fundamentally accurate, up-to-date information about you. And that's, that's what changes. That's, that's the, the, but you wouldn't see that the dentist would, but you would benefit from that. Yeah. Now, do you think, um, you know, I mean, the, the, as it grows, I mean, more people have the awareness of it and develop that trust. You said like, hey, you just got to trust it. And it's like what Elon Musk talks about. Hey, we already have the technology for the self-driving cars, but until we can get to the point where the data improve and show like the casualty rate being so much lower and, and develop the trust with the, the general public, like at that point, that's where we'll see 
all you know, our self-driving vehicles, right? Like of, of once you know, or much more, right? But there is that element of that consumer trust. And you know, do you, do you like, I mean, is that maybe an issue of why, um, I know it's blown up and taking, taken off, but not to the level it could is because of consumer trust. Cause maybe they still have a lot of concern. They don't have that trust. Well, I, I think part of the problem is that there's still a confusion between cryptocurrencies and blockchain. So people see this sort of fantastic rise of the price of Bitcoin and then the fall of Bitcoin. And, and people naturally correlate that with blockchain saying that blockchain is trusted and now blockchain is not trusted. So you have to sort of decouple those two. But to answer your question, what's going to happen is that the companies that you already work with, the companies that you trust, that you have the relationship, that have the brands, they will implement blockchain as a technology to enable their working practices to become more cost effective, more efficient, um, and more trustworthy or, or more, more effective. So the technology itself, again, it's the same parallel as when we talk about the travel industry, years and years ago, the travel industry had Saber, they had um, Amadeus. There were a number of different proprietary platforms that each individual travel agency and, and um, airline had to be on. And I can remember a time where the concept of changing flights would have taken probably a week of your life and would involve reams of paperwork and tickets. And now it's literally just a couple of clicks away. So that, but not all of that's behind the scenes. I don't see what happens. I just know that it's easy for me. So um, trust is something that will happen when the, when the big companies that we know and trust use blockchain and the benefits are that the products and services they provide will become better. So in the case of title and real estate and transactions, over time, as blockchain is used as the way of recording those transactions, they're going to get faster and more reliable and the transaction cost is going to get lower. So that's the benefit that we receive as the consumers of that, uh, of that service. Yeah, no, I love it. So then, um, all right, so then let's, let's talk about um, then cryptocurrency, right? So, you know, cause I mean, man, there's so many different types out there and there it, it, again, it's, you know, it does become confusing because it can be, you know, it can be hard to, I, I think for most of us to kind of grasp of, of you know, yeah, I mean, everybody's heard of Bitcoin, but there's, I don't know how many other different types of, of currencies, but can you just kind of do the same thing of a simplistic one-on-one breakdown of what cryptocurrency and how it works? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a way of, I mean, a, a, a bank account is a form of cryptocurrency because very few of us have all of our money in cardboard boxes stashed under the mattress. So we keep our money in digital format in the bank. So when we go online, we see there's a set of numbers there. Hopefully they're not red. Um, and those numbers represent the money that the bank is holding for us. So when we transfer money to someone else, we transfer it digitally by instructing the bank to send money from this account to that account. So those are, you know, those are digital representations of our, our money. And the bank uses mechanisms to transfer electronically and reliably from one account to another. So what cryptocurrency does is really says, well, let's take that requirement to transfer value from one person to another, but let's do it without using a bank. So in other words, if I had an electronic wallet, which is, could be a chip or could be a, an application on my phone, and I'm gonna put some value in that wallet in the same way I put dollars into my bank account, if lots and lots of people recognize that my coins have some potential value, if you were to accept my coins as payment, I could send you coins directly from my wallet to your wallet over the internet. I don't need a bank. It doesn't need to go through PayPal or it doesn't need to be any foreign exchange. So it's entirely free or you know, pretty much free to transfer value from me to you. And so that's what cryptocurrencies do. They, and those transactions are recorded on our dear friend, the blockchain. So, so the blockchain's first major outing to the public really was Bitcoin, because each Bitcoin transaction is recorded on a blockchain. But a Bitcoin transaction, and the reason Bitcoin has um, come into the sort of the public knowledge is it was the first 
alternative currency that wasn't a dollar and wasn't a yen and wasn't a euro or or a, a normal uh, a fiat currency, um, which is how you refer to them. So to cut a long story short, cryptocurrencies sit on top of the blockchain. They're a piece of computer code, but they're really interesting because they allow people to transfer value to somebody else without getting all the charges and friction associated with working with a bank. And you can transfer tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. I could transfer one billionth of a dollar to you. So that means every time someone watched your videos or listened to your podcast, if they paid you, you know, a hundredth of a dollar or a billionth of a dollar, um, that could come out of their accounts seamlessly without bank charges. And so what cryptocurrencies do is they give us the prospect of being able to transact a tiny granular level for things that previously we were never able to because it was so costly to try and get the banks involved. Yeah. No, I, mean, I, I mean, I love it. It's like, you know, I look at like this right here, you know, right? Yes. Like I got Apple pay right on there, go to it. Bam. I just, you know, now I have to, I get the fees of the credit card. I got to go still pay the credit card bill, but it's, I mean, essentially it just eliminates that, but it's like, essentially almost the same thing, right? Where it's just like, this comes up, bam, it just transfers, you know, right? Um, and again, and think about how life was a few years ago when it was all about checks and cash payments and you would walk around with your pocket jingling with a load of change. So fast forward five years from now, um, and there won't be thousands of cryptocurrencies. I think there'll probably just be a handful, but they'll be widely adopted. They'll be trusted. They'll be tested. They'll be secure. And they will be alternative payment mechanisms. But the banks will also use cryptocurrencies because it's a very efficient way of moving money around. And as we said, it's cost effective. It's trustworthy. So nothing's going to upset money nothing's going to change the world overnight but it's going to evolve and the way that we move value from one person to another one per person is going to be much more inclusive over time so all those guys in you know there's two and a half billion people who don't have bank accounts in the world so they don't need a bank account to be paid in cryptocurrency so the flow of money is going to change the value of um things that we produce will change because we can, we can start selling our videos. We can start putting prices on them. We can start adding um, value to the things that we create. So, and, and this might be a silly question, but I just, I, I don't know what I don't know, but then the, there's a currency then that, hey, they transfer X amount of, of you know, crypto to have whatever equaled. That ledger would be in the blockchain. Then would there ever like would I could it if I chose to eliminate the need for a bank? Well, you said we don't need yes. a bank. Yeah, no, no, you're right. absolutely no. right. And that's that's what all the big discussion is because of you know banks have a certain um, incredibly valuable role within our society. But for some things, which is literally trans transferring money to a friend, that's why we've got that's why PayPal was so successful and Venmo and Zello and. Um, you know, all of these peer to peer payment providers, the reason they've been so successful is that they satisfy a need, which is for people to easily send money to people without having to get involved in a bank. Now, crypto makes that much easier because, you know, let's say that um, I wanted to buy, you know, th th your work harder poster that's behind you. Um, so you'll say, OK, I will send this to you if you send me twenty five dollars. So if I want to send you twenty five dollars. A, I've got to trust the fact that you're going to roll that thing up and stick it in the mail to me. Secondly, you've got to trust that I'm going to send you $25. Thirdly, we then have to say 20 questions. Do you want me to send it to you by check, by cash, by PayPal? Do you want me to wire it, ACH it? Do you want me to do it in dollars, yen, euros? So all those questions. Whereas if we do it using cryptocurrencies on the blockchain, we can write code into the contract that says, the moment the package arrives, you get sent $25 worth of cryptocurrency and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, it doesn't cost anything. It doesn't go through the banks. We don't pay PayPal. We don't pay Venmo or any of those other guys. You know for certain the moment that that thing lands on my door, you get paid because it's written into the contract. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's the real value that, um, that cryptos can, can bring as well. Yeah, no, I love it. So yeah, you create those stipulations for like an if this, then that. We Absolutely. But imagine that on, that there's an electronic signature. Yeah, but imagine layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of those transactions. Then that starts looking like a real estate transaction. 
you know, if this works and that works, and if this title comes in, if that insurance is in place, if that loan's in place, then move the title from this person to that person. So you cut out all the lawyers and the layers because we can trust that mechanism because it doesn't lie. And we know that the blockchain sits there and we can't, we can't fool the blockchain because it keeps a record of everything. So that's the brave new world. That's, that's a few years out, but we're beginning to see, you know, movement towards that, um, you know, today. Yeah, I love it. So then, like, you know, I mean, a concern might be for those that, let's just say in real estate is, I mean, nobody's really paying cash for homes, right? It's everybody's getting a loan and you look at like the banks and I don't know the exact regulations they, but you know, years ago when I did some research on it, it was something like they only need to have their loan power. It's like they only have to have 10% of that cash actually at the bank, right? So if they had 10 million, they could, you know, or, 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 or let's just say you know, uh, a dollar, they yeah. could issue $9 of loan power. So if that crypto is not living in the bank, there's less money in the banks, less loans to be distributed that they might have that, you know, and again, I don't know how the federal reserve is working with that, with that, but you know, does that shoot us in the foot negatively with, you know, things of purchasing of, of, you know, real estate or whatever. Well, I think really you've got to look at money is very useful because it's the, it's the ability to move value from one person to another person. Um, and, I think I know what you're talking about, which is, I think it's called fractional reserve banking, where if I want to lend you some money, I don't actually need to have all that money in the bank because what I can do is I can use some of my assets. And um, I don't think there's going to be a big impact on that. I think really what we're doing is the banks are going to have to compete more for their customers. Yeah. So it's, and, and, and the money that they make from foreign exchange transactions will probably be reduced because they're going to lose some of those transactions to competitors but those competitors are going to be cryptocurrency companies as opposed to traditional banks but i think all of this is good for the consumer because what it does is it drives costs down it means that all of the intermediaries that are getting paid as part of transactions over time will probably fall away um, and we've seen that in all sorts of other industries where third parties and intermediaries have been um, really you know disintermediated literally because we don't need them anymore because if you take technology like email if you think about the impact that email has had on 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 mail generally or on um it, it, it's a, a, a uh, as i said the, the the impact is positive for the consumer it's you know it's critical that it's regulated it's critical that it's managed um, because we don't obviously want to go backwards in terms of, um, you know, the wrong money going to the wrong people, but that's, that's all part of it, I think. Yeah. So then, you know, when you look at like the, the government aspect, you know, right. Um, you know, and, and it seems like, and when I say this, like, I, this is just like, you know, pop ups on my phone, like, of, yes. of, like I haven't really done research on this, but you know, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about investing in, in Bitcoin and some other crypto, and, and I decided not to at that time because it was, you know, like there was a lot of fear from the government, federal reserve, yeah. whatever, of, of, you know, the regulation of it. And, you know, right, of, and, and then also like when you're talking about like, okay, hey, the ledger exists here. So I started to think about, man, which I love, but it's like the city departments have mass amounts of employees yeah. keeping those ledgers and, you know, and it eliminates you know, a lot of government jobs for little things like that, you know, right. County recorder's office or, or whatever, you know, potentially. And, and then when it comes to regulation, you know, right. Is, is like, how, how is, how would it be regulated for, like I say, as a business owner, like the IRS wants their money. It sounds like there could be so many loopholes around that, you know, right. Of. Well, actually it's funny, but there are probably likely to be fewer loopholes because you get loopholes if there's a gap in information. Now, if you have all the information and you can trust the information, then it's much easier to do tax returns. It's much easier to find if there's been, you know, fraud or misappropriation because, you know, the ledger doesn't lie. So going forwards, it's much easier to control where cryptocurrencies go, who's received them, where that money's gone, because every single transaction you keep track of. If you've got $10,000 in, you know, Benjamin sitting in your uh, briefcase there's no one can keep track of where that's gone so as we bring these technologies in a it improves 
the auditability generally of, of money and, and value. But from a, um, your point about uh, government workers, I think technology is one of those things that you can't stop. You can resist it, but it is the, it's the sort of the irresistible force. And the reason is it brings efficiency. It brings cost reductions. Um, and if you think about all of the government institutions that have moved from um, physical ledgers, and you know, I remember working 30 years ago for a, a local office where we would literally keep track of the, um, of the ins and outs of the, of the uh, uh, council's bank account with this large you know, pencil-driven ledger. Um, so you know, governments and institutions do move with the times. Um, there will be impact, but we don't know what those impacts are, but it's, it's a good thing generally, I think, to have those, uh, those efficiencies brought in. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, disagree with that, you know, because it's, you know, you, know, you hear stuff like, oh, every new piece of, of technology that automates, you know, loses like, you know, eight trades for that, you know, but it's like, look, at the end of the day, we all have to adapt, shift and change. Like, okay, yeah. instead of, hey, instead of working at McDonald's, now that he's replaced by a kiosk, go work for the, the company that's building the kiosks and, and, you know, like develop a new skill set, you know, right? Like, we, we it's just... It, like you said, it's inevitable. We can't, we're not going to you know, necessarily slow this down. My only thought with the government is until they have that control, um, you're right, of them trying to like get in the way of this being able to progress and be as great as it could be as quickly as, as it could. I think actually, you know, I remember reading one of the state's um, tax authorities um, accept payment in Bitcoin. So, you know, I, I yeah. have to find out if that's, you know, where that came from. I remember reading, reading the other day, but, but I, I, you know, I think, what we're trying to avoid generally is um, it's just a flouting of regulations that have been put in place for a reason to protect people. Um, and I think that's probably what will slow the adoption down because the technology has to fit with regulations. Just because it's a new technology doesn't mean that you tear up all of these laws that, we, you know, that have been you know, in place protecting people for years. Um, so there's a very large liberal um, part of blockchain that basically says that everything should be decentralized and, and um, you know, um, disconnected from, from banks and governments and regulations. But in the real world, that doesn't matter. I mean, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, you know, it's like I, I, I'm just thinking of an app. I have my phone called Expensify. You know, right? Like in every receipt that I, I have for a purchase for my business, I take a picture of it, smart scans it. Right. So it doesn't just scan it like it, it scans it, it reads it, it knows how to file it um, um, and where to file it. Um, yes. it creates that expense, you know, batches every single night to, to my bookkeeper. Um, you know, now we wouldn't have the receipt. Like I'm sure there'd be a service for Bitcoin. You know, I think about, like, like, as you said, like, I mean, it's, it's getting close to the end of the year. So we're all, all as entrepreneurs, it, it's never fun to have to. Yep. Spend I know hours mean. going through all your tax stuff. It's like, look, man, like this would just be instant, you know, right. Where, um, and then think too, like, I mean, how many times have we had like a, a, a contract come to some work in house and like, well, here's the price, but if you pay cash, you get 10% off. Like, you know, they're pocketing that cash and not claiming it, you know, right. Where it just yeah. eliminate that. And I think that's it. It's really the stuff that it's, it just allows, um, again, it's a technology, but the thing is it's for it to be really successful. You're not going to know it's there like expensify it's a fantastic product because it's because of what it does not because you don't know how it's built you don't know how it operates you don't know what the code is you don't need to know you yeah. just need to know it works and i think that's that's what we're going to see um and i think the noise about cryptocurrencies will gradually fade away and then what we'll see over the next you know two three four five years is just a, an explosion of technologies that really do some great things for us um and and just strip out all of those costs and, and we'll be scratching our heads in five years time saying why did we ever do it that way in the first place why did we ever have all of these different people involved in a house purchase why did i have to jump through so many fiery hoops to get a loan you know what i mean so that's that's what we're going to see will change and blockchain will be something that's just in the background and no one will talk about that and it'll just what we'll see is the, the positive results of of that that technology yeah, not, and I, man, I mean, I, I actually, um, an owner of a, I have a software company, a tech company, and 
you know, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm definitely pro all of it. Right. Um, and then you look at things like Amazon, you know, right. Like dude, all of our lives are better for me. Like I can't tell you how long it's, if you just break down, if we were to track per minute of time savings of not having to drive to Best Buy, just click two buttons and it shows up in your doorstep 24 hours. And like, you know, technology makes our lives better, makes it more efficient and, and, and allows us to spend more time with our kids and, and, you know, and that operate is- from, and that is exactly the case. So in other words, you know, now I never shop. Um, you know, why would I, why would you spend time doing things like, you know, driving somewhere and all the t- time is the most precious commodity that we have. So, and, and just imagine, you know, it's only Amazon's only really been with us for you know 20 years or so, which is not you know, 18, 19 years, which I know seems like a long time, but in the grand scheme of things, they have completely revolutionized the way that we um, spend time with our family, the way that we shop. Um, I cannot imagine a world without Amazon. I cannot imagine a world without being able to, you know, click on an app and have food delivered so that I can, you know, watch that final episode of Game of Thrones, you know, with my, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or something far more important with that than, than, than that. But, um, and you know, that's, um, I don't care. I don't know how Amazon works. I just know that it does work. Yeah. I know I can trust it. Yep. Yeah. It's like, all right, they got 220,000 employees. Think of all the purchases and they don't have one customer service rep, you know, right? Like we all love it. It's brilliant. But again, we don't need to know how it works. And, 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 um, you know, uh, yeah, totally agree there. So then, I mean, let's talk about what you guys are doing with quantum RE, you know, cause I mean, it's, again, it's, you know, like I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, my own experiences, like with a company like yours of, you know, like we're looking to uh, uh, do some remodeling to our house, right? I'm just doing some updating, you know, right? Um, you know, where get a contractor over, well, maybe I don't have the cash, right? Well, then if I'm going to ref- pull some out, man, I, it, it's, it's no different than buying a house. Like you got to go do the appraisal, which the appraisal costs 450 bucks. Then, you know, and, and getting along, I mean, you get grilled. You guys spend all this time doing all this stuff, jump through hoops and, Yep. You know, I mean, it's a 30 day process, you know, right. To even friggin' refi to pull out, you know, even if you have, you know, an insane amount of equity still, and you're just taking out a small, tiny bit of, of credit or line of credit or, you know, right. Um, like I was a real estate agent here in Phoenix, Arizona during the market crash, yep. you know, right. Where, you know, at that point there was no such thing as a line of credit. Like it's like, Oh, you got all this equity in your house, but they're not going to, it didn't exist. Exactly. You know, right. So I, I see this solving so many problems of, you know, Hey, now you can, or, or like, look, man, I have so many homeowners yeah. that have equity in their home, but they're cash poor, let's just say. They don't have the cash. But it's like, man, if you, if you could just put six grand in your house, we'd get you 20 grand more. But they can't, the, the process, it's just too much. They can't get through it. It's a big problem. Now, when we say big, we can quantify that. In the United States, there is $15.1 trillion dollars of equity in people's homes. And these are all published figures from the, you know, the Federal Reserve. Uh, um, and f- I think about 40% of that is in California. Now, you're absolutely right. That's money that you own. So if you have the equity in your home, that's your ownership. You own that. It's an asset. And if you, if you take an appraiser out and get him to walk around your property, he will write down on his clipboard what your house is worth. So you're not making this stuff up. You're sitting on an asset. People understand how to price it. It's valuable. There's a, you know, there are buyers for it. You own a percent of, percentage of that, yet you cannot get access to that unless you go to a bank and borrow money secured by that asset, which is, as you say, absolutely crazy. And the reason that that's happened is because that's how it's always been. And, and, The reason for that is how else do you find ways of selling some of your equity without selling your home? So about 10 years ago, um, a a company came up with this idea um, and the guys who set that company up are part of our team and part of our co-founders. Why not find a way of buying some of the equity in someone's home now so that when they sell their home, you get paid back and you share in some of the upside. So that's what we have is a contract, which is not involving title change or anything like that. Um, We have a a private contract with the homeowner that says, 
okay, we'll send an appraiser around, we'll agree the value of your property, we agree to participate in the potential future appreciation of your home because we like your home, we think it's gonna go up in value, so we'll buy a 10% slug of the future appreciation now. Here's a check, there's no cryptocurrency, no blockchain involved in that transaction. Here's a check, you agree that when you sell your home, you give us our original uh, payment back, and then on top of that, if it's gone up in value, we share in the appreciation of the value of your home. So that's how we make our return. So we create a real estate asset, and that asset's a really good asset because it's part of your home. You live there, you're cutting the grass, you're looking after it, you are the perfect steward of our, of our asset. And because of the work that you put in and because of um, the uh, connection you have to your property, it's likely to go up in value with the market as well. And when you sell it, we simply share in that upside. That asset we take and put into a fund, which is structured as a REIT, so we get the tax advantages of a REIT. But rather than issue shares in that fund, we create digital shares, which is a bit like Bitcoin, but backed by real estate assets. So we take all the really good things about cryptocurrencies, all of the efficiencies and the low cost of being able to sell this from person to person without needing banks. But we solve that volatility problem by making each one of our coins represent ownership in this pool of properties. So we're taking the real estate asset, we're chopping it up into tiny pieces, we're enabling people to trade that. But for you as the homeowner, you benefit because you can unlock the value without taking on more debt. So then uh, let's just say, I'm like, all right, you know, um, hey Matt, I, I wanna sell you some of my equity to go you know, update my kitchen or whatever. Um, how long does that process take, you know, in comparison to like the 30 day average refi? It's about the same actually, because um, we've got to, first of all, there's the time it takes, you know, you fill the format online, then we'll send an appraiser around. Um, then we have to do title checks, um, and we have to get confirmation from your bank, what your outstanding mortgage is. Those are the things that take time. But the big difference is that we, we probably already made the decision as soon as the appraisal comes back. So the rest of it is only going to knock the deal out. We don't need, it's, we're not going to underwrite this based on your ability to increase your debt. It, so it takes time because it's a real estate transaction. We also need to register it on title as a, uh, we're a lien holder. So we'll have a, um, a performance deed of trust. So we sit there as a junior lien. So we sit behind the, the lenders. So we have to register all of that and that takes a little bit of time. But you know that you've got much more chance with us um, of being accepted because we don't care how much money you earn. You could be earning zero income. Or it credit. You don't, you don't need, you know. The only reason we look at credit is if you have an existing mortgage, then we need to be confident that you're gonna be able to continue to pay your mortgage. But if you don't have a mortgage, why would we do a credit check? Yeah, yep, yep. And then, you know, what, what do, and just in comparison, so like if somebody's, you know, cause I mean, our show is all real estate agents, yes. right? So if they're educating their, their clients about, about your company, um, you know, cause it's like, hey, look, you know, typically real estate agents, we're dealing with a client at the time of sell and purchase, right? But how you create an amazing real estate business is keeping that relationship alive for that seven to 10 years in between time, you know, right. Um, and you know, we're checking in every nine days, conversations come up, Oh yeah, we're thinking about doing this, you know, and, and whatever. And it's like, Hey, here's an awesome option. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it just becomes another thing that we can educate another, you know, I guess exactly. tool that we can add to our toolbox of, of, of value that we can bring to them. Um, you know, just like, for example, if they wanted a pool, like, Hey, I refer, here's the pool company, but then also, you know, instead of going through the pool company's finance, there could be a better option. Right. So yeah. like here's, you know, and, and, how does it compare then for them of, you know, cause you're buying a percent of the equity compared to like a bank would just give you that money yes. um, and they would charge their loan origination fee there. You know, like, like, I mean, what, what, when it comes to overall fees, they pay, like, what would be the upside and what would be the potential downside? Well, we, we charge uh, between, so between three and 4% of the amount that we advance is 
fees to us. So in other words, if we released $100,000, you would net between ninety six dollars and $97,000, depending on you know, the underwriting process. So we make our money by taking a little clip of the ticket at the top. But remember, there's no monthly payments. There's no debt after that point. So that the rest of the money that you have is yours. And you can actually go and invest that if you want, uh, or you can use it to pay down your mortgage. That's the, that's the really funny thing is that a lot of people historically have taken a piece of equity and have paid their mortgage off with it. Yeah. So, um, but from, from a realtor's perspective, it's a really good way of maintaining, as you say, that relationship. Because what we can do, um, and every realtor is able to see how a house has appreciated over the last year. You just go to our website, we just go to Zillow. And you can say, well, your house, you bought your house for a million dollars last year. We think it's worth about $1.3 million now because you know, your market's done really well. Um, how would you like to release some of that equity without taking on more debt? And because we are a licensed real, uh, licensed real estate uh, um, uh, you know, company, we're licensed by the California BRE, we're able to pay commissions. So of that payment that we take from the homeowner, then we can certainly make it a valuable transaction for the realtor by um, you know, paying them some of the commission that we generate. So realtors are uh, a very important, valuable channel to market for us. Um, and we're helpful to them because we're giving them alternative financial uh, options. So if someone's, you know, fallen on hard times and, or maybe just doesn't want to take out that extra $5,000 a month, you know, uh, you know, mortgage payment, we're a great option. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I again, go back to, you know, 2007, when, when, you know, when the markets, you know, I mean, you had so many people getting these, these, you know, arms that, yes. that, that the, then, Absolutely. you know, it got adjustable, went up and it wasn't necessarily, I mean, the lack of equity came when the market started crashing, but the market started crashing because people couldn't, not just because, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but yes. if people that their payment overnight jumped up to 300 bucks a month yep. and, and now they can't afford the house, you know, right. Um, and, and it just kind of kept snowballing where, you know, right. Um, with that situation, cause their equity, they had the same equity, you know, right. That could potentially solve, you know, uh, could have solved a lot of those problems. And, um, and again, part of the problem really was also, um, if you, if you go right up to the very top level, which is the banks that were, um, securitizing all of these loans, a lot of the time they didn't know what they were actually buying into. Yeah. And what the blockchain does is the blockchain would have helped solve that problem because, if you were buying a, a tape of assets, then if those assets were on the blockchain, then you would know categorically what those assets are, where they are, what they're worth, what you know, who the owners are, what the overall debt and equity position is. So the blockchain would have added much needed transparency, which would have probably prevented um, a lot of the issues that occurred in, in, in the uh, global financial crisis back in you know, 07, 08. And then with, with, as the blockchain grows and expands, um, um, and, and services that plug into it, you know, um, increase. And then you look at like artificial intelligence, right. Of, you know, it, like for example, I was reading an article the other day about how, how artificial intelligence can affect real estate, right. Of, okay. Hey, they, it'll be able to look at every photo and then plus recent sales of every photo and instantly recognize this type of granite versus this type, create evaluation, you know, right. Where, you know, right now it's about the same time as, is a, a refi but within a couple of years, you know, right. Especially with title and the ledgers, like you could have this down where it is almost instant over time. Right. Cause your valuations, you know, could, with through AI could be. Well, okay. Well, you're right. And what you're doing is say AI is a very interesting technology as well, because I mean, it has you know, obviously thousands and thousands of uses, but if you're able to predict if you, with this particular house, if you can use, AI to say, if you were to add a building on the right hand side with this number of square feet, you would probably increase the value of your home by, you know, X percentage. So in other words, you could use AI to predict an increase in value of your home based on certain types of work that you do based on your neighborhood, based on what other people have done. So in other words, that's very useful from a homeowner's perspective, because they can see if I built a pool on this side, I'd make the house more valuable than if I built it on that side. But what we do is we, we provide that funding mechanism. So 
we are, you've got these increased efficiencies that come from all these different technologies, but ultimately um, what we're doing is we're benefiting the consumer. I think that's what it all boils down to is the consumer wins, um, the homeowner wins, the, the realtor wins. Um, you know, you have opportunities that we just didn't have before. Now, are there any restrictions like, okay, do they have to be um, the actual physical homeowner compared to, let's just say, for example, I had a, a rental property across the street and it's like, yep. man, if, if, you know, I did X, Y, Z to it, um, um, you know, I could raise my rent 300 bucks a month, cash flow to this. And really, cause you know, with the investment property, it's a long-term hold. Yeah. For most. No, 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 that's fine. No, no, we're, we're very happy because if there's enough equity in the, in the property, because we're underwriting the property, um, if you've got a tenant there, then that's great. That means that the debt associated with it is likely to be paid. So no, we're, we're more than happy to, um, to buy some of the equity in a non-owner occupied single family residence. So, uh, and that's a great deal if you are, as you were saying, a, an owner of maybe half a dozen properties or, or even you know, huge portfolios. We allow you to raise capital based on the equity because you know, a lot of landlords are probably maxed out in terms of what they can borrow. But if there's equity there, then we can release that, which might allow you to expand your portfolio or you know, fix the house up or do whatever you need to do. Is it, is it all single family attached or do you get into you know, any type of apartment buildings or? It's, we, we focus on single family because a, there's lots of them. There's, you know, yeah. there's, a, there's, 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 there's quite a few, in, particularly in California. Um, and it's an asset that we can be very specific and, and um, leverage our expertise in that single asset. So, um, and, and we don't have any plans to move outside of that. We certainly don't have any plans to move into commercial or um, potentially development land if it's attached to a single family residence. But, you know, we want to be very focused on that um, enormous asset class because you know, as I said, that's plenty to keep us busy. Yeah, no, I, I think it's brilliant. You know, if you, if you look at, um, I mean, we're, we're so underbuilt right now. Um, you know, I mean, it would take, you know, three decades to catch up to, to a healthy build rate based on population growth and rooftops. And, you know, um, um, it, it, it's just, I mean, you look at, you know, for a long time, you like a, a, a Blackstone, you know, like the largest yeah. real estate hedge fund on the, like these guys would never look at single family attached. They're swallowing up as much as they can. Yeah. You know, right. And, and there's a reason that, you know, smart money, if you will, you know, right. Is, is just swallowing these things up, you know, right. Cause it's like, I mean, popular people are making, have babies at a, at a faster rate now. And, and it's funny cause that the impact of those is because there was a recent, uh, law in California that was passed, the ADU, which stands for Auxiliary Dwelling Unit. So it's now absolutely um, acceptable to build the equivalent of a, you know, a granny annex um, on your property. Um, and if you want to, to rent it out, because there's an acknowledgement that in certain areas, there is a housing shortage. In certain areas, it's underbuilt. Um, so in the areas where there's a, a, sh a shortage, or in fact, in any area, in California, you're now allowed to build on your property um, an additional dwelling unit. So there's no issue with code. You know, you can plumb it up, you can live in there. Um, and for us, that's great because you know, it's a great way for people to spend the money that they release from their equity. Why not? If you've got a large backyard, build a small apartment or you know, something that you could rent out to Airbnb. You're leveraging your equity. There's no debt, you've got more income. So it's a, you know, it's a great way of using our equity release, the change in regulations. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah. You know, one thing that, you know, again, I mean, this opens up so many opportunities and mine just keeps going on, on different opportunities, but it's like, you know, I'll, I'll, anytime I have a chance to just pick somebody's brain that's like in their mid eighties or 90, you know, nineties, uh, you know, right. Of, and I'll ask them a question like, Hey, you know, cause you hear the stories of, oh, I got this $16,000 house in, in Newport beach. That would be now, you know, I'm like, Hey, if you could have figured out a way to, to, yeah, I mean, life events, you're going to have to buy up and then, you know, buy down. But if, if you could have figured out a way to keep every piece of real estate you ever owned, like, would you have done? I mean, it, it's always a hell yeah. So their wealth would have been enormous. Uh, and that's a massive issue. We look at right now only 2% of Americans at the age of 65 or older can retire without the government 
or their fam being reliant on the government yes. or the family. So this allows them, like if I have a, let's just say first time buyer, it's like, hey, let's go buy this house, right? And then, you know, with you, like with what you guys have in place, like, hey, we can put a tenant in place, you know, take that down payment, still cash flow good on this, have that as a long-term hold, you know, use that for the next one. And then, you know, you're helping, you're helping your clients build true wealth, you know, right? While you guys are building wealth and everybody wins. Absolutely. And the reason that works is because you're taking your asset and you're selling it to someone who wants your asset. Yeah. What you're not doing is you're not taking on more debt. Now, it, the biggest problem that people have in that, the idea of maintaining their um, real estate is that they would, their debt payments would get so big so quickly that they would never be able to afford it because they would never be able to cash in the equity. But, but this could be a very interesting, we've had all sorts of different sort of debates and discussions from a macroeconomic perspective. If this thing really takes off in scale, and it won't just be us, there'll be all sorts of other companies doing the same as us, hopefully. But capital moves in um, to people's homes. That capital then goes back into supply, goes back into circulation. It, it means that there's less reliance from a, an economic perspective on debt because we're simply moving money out of assets into the, in, into the economy as a whole. So um, it's just generally good. I mean, debt is bad, full stop. There's no such thing as good debt. It works, it oils the machinery, but overall it's a, you know, a suboptimal um, solution. Moving assets around and ownership of assets is a much better way of doing it. Um, and, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency could provide that cost and efficiency benefit that might just uh, you know, enable that to happen. So on the backs, on the other side of it, like what, what you guys are investing in and it goes into the REIT, um, you know, is it, is it all just, you know, privately held or, or do you allow, you know, like if I was like, Hey man, I, I want to, I, I want to put a couple hundred grand into this. Like do you allow other buy-ins, right? That then can, you know, share a percentage of that. Like, you know, they might buy into a REIT. Yeah, no, exactly. Our REIT is open to, uh, you know, any accredited investor. So the REIT buys into that pool of houses. So you can't yet buy into a specific house. But, you know, if you are a, an investor and you're accredited right now and you're based in the US, you could go to our platform, go online. Um, you know, we'll ask you a few questions to find out, make sure you pass the sort of accreditation and qualification. But then you can invest a minimum of $1,000. Or, and you know a maximum of pretty much whatever you like. You would then buy into a whole pool of these, you know, of these homes and the, and the equity interests in them. Yeah, I mean, from the investor standpoint, I mean, it's so it's such an awesome vehicle, right? Because it's, I mean, number one, especially with with, I mean, according to um, you know NER right now, um, you know, I think we're like 1.2 million new builds. Yep. per year short of what we should be just for sustainable growth. Which is right? huge, so which is a big gap. So it's a demand, right? So yeah, we're gonna have corrections in and out, whatever, but long-term, like, like this is a great, you know, I mean, this is a solid play. I mean, we have, yes. we have population growth vastly exceeding new rooftops and- and, and we know it's an asset class we all know. We know there's an enormous amount of research on single family owner-occupied homes. There's all sorts of indices like the case Shiller index. There's all sorts of reports. We've got price transparency. We've got visibility. It's not an esoteric asset class. It's not a commercial deal where you're worried about the lessee here or the, the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, uh, you know, retail index there. It's straightforward. It's scalable. And, um, uh, you know, what, what crypto and blockchain does is it makes it accessible to people and it gives them the opportunity to sell. So it creates liquidity, which is sort of takes us full circle to, you know, the beginning where we talked about taking a big asset class and using blockchain and, and, and um, crypto technologies to turn something big and illiquid into something liquid. And that's really, that's the, the quantum leap that I think we're, um, you know, moving forwards. Yeah, because I mean, if you look at the real estate investment space, I mean, it's gotten so saturated where, I mean, it, like the apartment game is so saturated, the, the mobile home game is so saturated. And then most, you know, real estate prices, like if I had to go pay, you know, buy a, a, a single family detached house, the, the, the ROI on the, that you get, you know, because rents haven't kept up with all this appreciation that we've seen, you know, right? Um, I mean, it's getting less and less and less of a, a vehicle for, 
unless you're a huge player with deep pockets, you know, yes. or, 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 you know, you go out there and create some syndication, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get into that game. It's so competitive where this creates that alternative option where you can go out there and, and massively win in, in a different way, you know, right? And, yeah, and it's, it's, it's access to an asset class that is previously untapped. So in other words, you know, in any real estate investment portfolio, you want to have a range of different exposure to different asset classes. But this is, I think, the only way so far that you can get exposure to equity in single family owner occupied residences. And you know, that's a very compelling asset class for many investors because it just means they've got access to something that is important. It's part of the fabric of, of America, but you know, w without us, it's very difficult to actually get involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So, and, and accredited, um, what, what are the, what are the stipulations? I mean, isn't it it's, it's uh, half a million a year that you got to make or have some, you know, I think it's, two, it's 200,000 a year, um, over the last couple of years, plus the prospect of, you know, continuing to earn that, or it's a million dollars in net assets, excluding your primary residence. But I think that's going to change. So I think that's, that's been around for some time. It doesn't really reflect, you know, someone's experience or, you know, just because you've got a million dollars of net worth doesn't mean to say that you're any more qualified as an investor than someone's got, you know, half of that. So I think over, you know, in the near term, we're going to see the SEC actually addressing the definition of an accredited investor, um, you know, particularly because what we really want is money flowing from qualified people who understand what they're getting involved with um, into projects that need that capital. So, um, you know, a change in the way that accreditation is is put together, I think, is certainly on the cards and uh, will be very well received. Yeah, and, and and the reason I'm asking all of this is, you know, like our our listeners, right, and and just like real estate agents. I mean, it's very difficult to find the right investment vehicle. And I mean, of course, we always want to invest in the product that we're selling, and we all believe in real estate, and that's why we're here. Yes. But again, it's getting harder and harder. You know, right? Um. And, and, and with real estate, the scary thing about being a real estate agent is, you know, like, look, at the end of the day, you just really have a job. Yeah, you're, you're classified as an entrepreneur per the IRS, but you don't have a sellable asset at the end of the day. Like, you get done, you take your license down, and, you know, so we've got to be smart with stock and away some of those commissions because there's no pensions. There's no, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. So, you know, I'm looking at this of, because there's a lot, you know, there's got a lot of agents that might make three, four hundred grand a year. That's like, hey, man, I could, I could just easily just, you know, stuff two grand a month into this, you know, right. And yeah. just keep investing away where well, it still allows them to invest in, in real estate where now they have a shot to do it. Cause they don't have 10 million to go invest in this apartment building. Exactly. Invest in the product they believe in and, and create that long-term wealth wealth and that we don't have otherwise, you know, right. And again, it's it. It's, it's investing in something, you know, if I'm a realtor, I would love to invest in single family homes because I know that business. Um, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't want to invest in commercial because I don't know the business, but um, so that's why I think there's going to be a fairly big demand for what we're doing because, you know, people understand residential real estate. Um, and I think giving a way to get access to that could be, you know, could be quite interesting. So then, you know, going to, you know, the, the, the Bitcoin, you know, right. Or, or whatever the crypto is, um, you know, cause it, cause the, the paid out, like if you, Hey, I want to X out of my investment where they're paid in, in, in that, um, you know, and, and again, man, there's like, dude, I have been pitched, you know, I mean, you got cryptocurrencies that are now multi-level marketing yeah, 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 and yeah. all this stuff. And it's like, man, it's like, well, what, what the hell is this? And, you know, like I get the dollar and the inflation and, and, you know, that, yes. but you know, with Bitcoin, like the rise and then the massive yes. crash and like, like what do people need to watch out for with that? And, and it's, well, I think with cryptos generally, um, they're not backed by anything. So their price moves up and down depending on sentiment. And the other thing with cryptocurrencies is it's very easy to manipulate the markets because they're not perfect markets. They're not registered or regulated. It's very easy for someone to come in with a large amount of crypto and move the price up or down to suit them. So it is an incredibly uh, volatile, speculative uh, place to invest your money. If you get the timing right, you can do really well out of it. Um, our 
token, which is called EQRE, uses cryptocurrency technologies, but is backed by real estate assets. So um, our currency is, you know, or our token is much more predictable. Um, but again, things to watch out for. It's a roller coaster ride. So if you like that sort of thing, um, there's still a ton of money to be made, but you know, just be prepared to lose your money because there's nothing that underpins many of these cryptocurrencies um, in terms of assets or intrinsic value. So it has to be right at the very last few percentage of your absolute, you know, um, gambling part of your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, cause you, you hear people, you know, again, I don't know if this stuff's true. It's just crappy here on the, should be a Facebook feed, but like people losing all their crypto because they forgot the pat their password and they can't remember. And, you, and those, and again, that those are absolutely real issues. Those will be resolved over time because that just is really just a function of the technology being a bit, you know, early stage that really shouldn't happen. You know, you shouldn't be in a position where you've got to remember a 200 digit hexadecimal code, <clears throat> you know, but um, you know, th that is the risk. I think that those types of issues will be um, repaired or, or, or um, you know, made redundant by advances in, in uh, you know, in trading applications. So then, um, um, I mean, with, with so many, you know, different cryptos out there, and, you, and your prediction is, like, there's a lot, but there you're going to have a dozen rise that then own and dominate the space, you know, right? I'd say probably um, less than that. I'd say probably about half a dozen, you know, five or six primary tokens or primary currencies um, will be used globally for doing slightly different things. And I think Bitcoin will definitely be one of them. Um, and I don't know what the other ones will be. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think we'll see that, that collapse or that, um, uh, you know, what's the word? The, uh, uh, you know, general, uh, um, you know, re reduction in, in number of players in the market. And that's, that's beginning to happen now. So then is, is there like, is there any like, Hey man, like these are the three things to look for the three red flags to make sure to not look for. Like, you know, you said, you know, yours is e EQR. I'm sure there's a reason. You know, that yeah, ours, ours, the only one I can really talk about with any authority is ours because all the other ones, uh, whatever I say today could absolutely change tomorrow. So, um, but I can tell you that our token, you know, is backed by a pool of assets, um, that are audited, that are transparent, um, that we can prove. And so with our token, you get the benefit of the sort of tradability, but you also get the benefit of knowing that it's actually worth something. Um, and it depends entirely on your stomach. So if you have an iron stomach and you're happy to go with the, you know, massive volatility of some of those cryptos, there are some crazy plays out there that move up and down, you know, hundred percent a day. Um, having lost, you know, an arm and a leg over the years in um, speculative stock market investments, I'm now um, inoculated against that type of activity. So I much prefer going with things that I can see where the true intrinsic value is making. And, and, and then through my own research, I can decide whether or not I think something is valuable and then buy it based on that decision. So, but again, it's horses for courses. Yeah. I mean, uh, the equivalence, uh, at least my head goes is it's like when the dollar was backed by gold, like, I, I mean, you know, you, you know, I mean, real estate doesn't appreciate this, you know, it's kind of, you know, whatever, but over time, historically for, you know, 150 years of data, you know, it's, you know, you're like, it's dependable and you, you know what that looks like. And, exactly. you know, um, you know, but it's backed by something that you know that you can trust. Yeah. So love it. So, um, man, I know, I know we're going super long here on time but I, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to respect your time. I can keep picking your brain. This stuff's so interesting, man. No, it's, I really appreciate it. It's, it's, so, it's fantastic being on. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, just one last thing of, of like, where do, where do people go to get more information about your guys' company, what you do, you know, learn more about this. Like, where's the best place to go? Well, it, it's, it is our website. I mean, we've spent um, quite a bit of time putting together, you know, videos and articles just to try and give people an idea about 
not just what we're doing, but what the market's doing generally. So the website's quantumre.com, which is Q-U-A-N-T-M-R-E.com. And there's a whole host of videos. I'm afraid most of those are me as the talking head. So apologies in advance for, you know, you know, you'll become saturated um, to the point of uh, no return. But um, that's the best result. So if you want to get in contact with us, if you have any questions, um, you know, the platform's live. We'd you know, love to answer anything that you've got. Yeah, absolutely love it. So, um, and, and everybody that's watching, listen, those links will be right right below to make it super easy on you there. So um, well, I know in every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation truly is the start of the illusion. Information is a power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on it that creates the power in our lives for us to go out there and create the, the life that we know we want and deserve. Um, and, uh, you know, you guys just heard so much amazing information from Matt. And again, like us real estate agents, man, that's stuff that we really need to get versed on and, and stay ahead of the curve on. And, and it, with all the disruptions that are taking place in our industry, look, we, we've got to make sure that we're staying ahead of, of the curve with delivering massive value and resources to our clients. At the end of the day, we don't sell real estate, you know, right? We're in the human connection, human resource business, and it's our job to go out there and be a valuable asset and a resource to our clients. Um, and this is just another way, a way for them to create uh, more wealth, uh, uh, invest, and, and, you know, it just opens up the opportunities, which I love. So, you guys, make sure you take this stuff very seriously. Again, right below will be uh, the link to Quantum RE, so you can check that out. And Matt, man, this is... Uh, uh, this has been awesome. I truly thank do appreciate you. taking no, it. It's been great fun, Josh. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been wonderful going on. So you know, thank you for listening to me for so long. <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing. It's so interesting, man. And it's here. Like we, we get, you can't yeah. bury your head in the sand, man. It's, it's here. So we've got to be educated on. So I love it. So all right, guys, thanks so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.